Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that drops it like it's hot and picks it up when it's cold. He is the captain. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. This week we are drinking Sneaky Wheat by the one and only Scofflaw Brewing and beautiful and what a great sports city as well, Atlanta, Georgia. What is not sneaky about this wheat beer is the great flavor. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. Even if you don't love wheat beers, try it anyway because you're going to love this one. It's an imperial American wheat with amazing taste. Lots of orange, citrusy goodness and hints of coriander spice masking the strong but unnoticeable 8% ABV. And Sneaky Wheat was brought to us by all of you, but especially this garage crew. Let's go out to Minnesota and give a cheers to Kevin from Inver Grove Heights. He's very sneaky. And a big shout out to Lauren in Vancouver. Here's a cheers to Allison the Blonde Terror from Braceville, Illinois. And a big shout out to Jane in Spain. Next, a huge, huge thank you and long distance cheers to Kiko Bang all the way in Seoul, South Korea. And last but certainly not least, a morning time cheers. Cheers to John T. up in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. John says he has some purple drink for breakfast. All right. If you want to fill up the fridge with some purple drink, then you can go to our website, truecrimegarage.com, and click on the donate banner. And while you're there, check out the store page. We have new Army logo tees for both men's and women's. Mm -hmm. And we also restocked the Douche Canoe shirts and men and women and we did a different color so they're now purple and gold so you want to check those out all right that's enough of the business everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime courage have her smile just the way she's so happy and the way she interacts with people it's just it's amazing tara grinstead Irwin county high school teacher and former beauty pageant contestant had a huge impact on the tiny town of osilla population 3300 so much so that her disappearance almost two weeks ago has galvanized this community tara's older sister anita I cannot even express how my family and our friends, I mean, the outpouring of love for Tara. We knew they loved her. 30-year-old Tara Grinstead was last seen October 22nd when she attended a local pageant. Her home sits locked, car in driveway, even her dog left outside. Only her purse and keys are missing, leading many to suspect she left with someone she knew. The GBI has interviewed Tara's ex-boyfriend of six years, as well as a former student who broke into her home recently. Yes, they've talked to these people, and, and you know they're talking to several people, all the friends, uh, families, uh, work acquaintances. But those who knew the beautiful, generous young woman say if someone did snatch Tara, it could be almost anyone. All the guys in our school like Miss Tara. She is beautiful. She is somebody everybody wants to be like, so that might have something to do with it. If someone had come there and said, one of your students is in trouble, or one of your teachers needs your help, she would have gone. Tara Faye Grinstead was born in Hawkinsville, Georgia on November 14, 1974. From an early age, Tara was involved in the beauty pageant circuit. She was Miss Tifton in 1999, and one year she made it all the way to the Miss Georgia pageant. Her talent for these shows was singing. Tara's parents were separated at the time of her disappearance, which took place in 2005. Tara's mother, who still lived in Hawkinsville, was suffering from an illness. Tara was very close with her sister Anita and her sister's husband Larry. She was also very close to her father Bill and stepmother Connie. She was a family person. And although she was from Hawkinsville, Tara lived and worked in Osilla, a small town of about 3,000 people. Osilla is about an hour's drive from her hometown of Hawkinsville. 
Despite her love for the pageant life, Tara was not satisfied with being a beauty queen. She had goals. She had career goals. And she used her pageant winnings to fund her quest for a higher education. Tara earned her bachelor's, and then she's eventually going to go on to earn her master's at Valdosta University. She moved to Osceola as a student teacher and fell in love with the town. In 2005, Tara was an 11th grade history teacher at Irwin County High School, where she had taught for eight years, and by all accounts, she was well-liked by her students. In addition, she was attending night school four nights a week to get her Ph.D. in history and administration. Mm. She attended night classes at various campuses of VSU, including campuses in the towns of Waycross and Tifton. Her ambition, according to friends and family, was to work her way up to high school principal or to be a college history professor. Tara loved being an educator. She was known to go above and beyond for her students. And on occasion, she helped pay for prom dresses or yearbooks for some of the students who could not afford such things. Which is very nice. And also, we know that teachers do not make what what they should make. So she's doing this on a teacher's salary. She also had a supplemental job at a makeup counter at a local department store. And she also volunteered in the pageant circuit and at homecoming to help students and their friends get ready for competitions or dances by doing hair and makeup. At the time of her disappearance, Tara lived in a meticulously decorated small rental house on Park Street. She had a dog named Dolly and a cat named Herman. Tara was close with her neighbors and enjoyed gardening when she could find the time in her busy schedule. Tara also attended church regularly, and she was incredibly social, but she did not drink. She also took self-defense classes. By all accounts, Tara was a wonderful, outgoing, giving person who stood out in the small town of Osceola. Now let's get to the day of her disappearance. This was a Saturday. The date, October 22nd, 2005. Tara had some students over to her house to help them prepare for the Miss Sweet Potato pageant, which was taking place in Fitzgerald, a nearby town. This was around 3 p.m. that afternoon. According to one of the students who was there, Dana Wilder, Tara was in a great mood. Nothing about Tara's behavior seemed odd. Then Tara attended the pageant. After attending the pageant that evening, Tara stopped by a neighbor's house to visit for about Half an hour. Now, the name of this neighbor has not been released, and this would have been around 8 p.m. She then went to a barbecue at the home of the former school superintendent. This is Dr. Troy Davis and his wife, Missy. This was a party. I don't know how many people were in attendance, but a get-together nonetheless. On the menu for that evening, watching the mighty Georgia Bulldogs football game, socializing and enjoying some good old Southern barbecue. Her friend, Maria Hewlett, is going to be able to confirm that not only did they watch the game, but they also had dinner that evening. Friends later told police that Tara had received several cell phone calls while she was at the party. At approximately 11 p.m., Dr. Davis walks Tara to the door as she gets ready to leave. She tells Dr. Davis that she is going home for the evening. In fact, she said she was going to go home and watch a video of the pageant from earlier that day. That is the last known sighting of Tara Grinstead. Now, Tara was really close with her neighbors. Well, specifically Myrtle and Joe Portier. Mm -hmm. So much so with the Portiers that they had a key to Tara's home. And Tara's family knew that the Portiers looked out for Tara. Joe and Myrtle, knowing that Tara lived alone and having to drive long distances many nights a week to attend her night classes... They had established some kind of system with Tara to make sure that she had arrived home safely in the evenings. They would look for her bedroom lamp to come on, and seeing it, they would know that she was home safe and sound. This system didn't seem to apply on the weekends, though, because Joe and Myrtle were often, they often left town to go to their weekend home. Right. And on Sunday, October 23rd, this is around midnight, Tara's mother called the Portiers at their home. This is roughly 24 hours after the last sighting of Tara. Her mother had told them that she was unable to reach her daughter and asked them if they had seen her that day. They said that they had not seen her. However, because they were out of town, this wouldn't have been unusual. Right. But 
that her car, Terra's car, which is a pearl colored Mitsubishi 3000 GT, it was parked in the carport at Terra's house when they had returned from their out of town stay. The next day on Monday morning, October 24th, Joe Portier noticed that Tara's car was still at her house, but there didn't seem to be any sign of Tara herself. He walked to Tara's house, knocked on the door. There was no answer. He knocked several more times. He checked the door. The door was locked. Joe was concerned. He called the high school and he asked about Tara. Had they seen her? Had they heard from her? He was told that Tara had not come into work that morning, which was extremely rare. Right. And they had not even heard from the young woman. Joe then decided to use his key to open the door and enter the home. Inside, he found no one. Tara was not there. There were some things that caused concern. Joe noted that Tara's bedroom lamp was broken and propped up in two pieces, and her alarm clock was lying on the floor. The alarm clock they found is not the right time. It's actually off by six hours. And strangely, Tara's cell phone was in the house. This is odd because obviously this is something you would expect for her to take with her, but it was at the house and it was still resting on the charger. Right. Joe, who had entered the home, is an Osceola city councilman. So he had the chief of police's phone number at his disposal and he decided to call chief. This is Mr. Billy Hancock directly and told him that he had spoken to Tara's mother and to her work. No one had seen or heard from Tara. Her car was parked at her house her cell phone was inside, and Tara was nowhere to be found. Joe believed something could have happened to her at the very least. Tara was missing. So a missing persons report was filed at that time, and at 8.50 a.m., police arrived at the scene at Tara's home. By 11 a.m., police had called in the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Investigators noted a few things right away. The house had been found by Joe to be locked, so there was no signs of forced entry. Although Tara's cell phone was still at the house, her purse and car keys were nowhere to be found. There are conflicting reports about Tara's car. This is whether or not it was locked or unlocked at the time that the authorities found it. Right. Tara's sister Anita says that the vehicle was unlocked, which she also goes on to say was completely out of character for her sister. Another curious thing about the car, investigators noted that the driver's side seat was pushed all the way back as though a tall person had been driving it. Although Tara was only about five foot three inches tall. So on a good day, Captain, I'm six foot one. And okay. I have never driven a Mitsubishi 3000 GT, but in most cars, uh, specifically cars, not like big trucks or anything, right. practically all of them when it comes to cars, I'm an all the way back seat guy. So, so they're you're saying you're a suspect. I'm yes. And not only am I a suspect, but I'm guilty. <laughs> so unless there was some other reason for this, well, that's shocking, you know, unless maybe she moved the seat to look for something or right. I, I can't think of why the seat would have been moved other than I would be expecting a person to have been operating this vehicle to have been about six foot or maybe taller. Well, I think you lean more towards somebody operating this vehicle because the keys are gone. Yeah, and furthermore, there was $100 in cash on the dashboard or console of the car. And I say dashboard or console because it's been reported both ways. Right. There was also found to be clay or mud on the tires of the vehicle. And this would be as if someone had driven it off-road at some point. But now we did talk about her going to a barbecue earlier. So is it possible that she parked in somebody's grass and maybe got a little bit of mud on her tires there yeah you and i specifically talked about that meaning that it could it could have nothing to do with her disappearance it could be from the events of that evening before she went missing right you know there's a a bonfire that you and i used to go to regular attendance it was once or twice a year and people were instructed to park in the person's yard you know the person lived out in the country and you only have so much driveway they would say just park in the yard Right, And so you would leave there and you might have mud on the tires or, or in this situation, clay on the tires. I did look up, you know, we talked about the barbecue. I did look up to find where that person, the host of the barbecue lived. Right. And it didn't seem to me to be like 
out in the country, out in the sticks. It looked to me to be more of a traditional neighborhood. Now, that's not to say that she didn't park on the street and end up with two tires in somebody's yard. Well, and then to go back to, she did go to this pageant, and I, I know sometimes when a, a high school or a school or or any place would like host a big event, you know, such as possibly this um, pageant would be, maybe she parked her car in the grass during that as well. So again, don't know, but to me, I'm leaning more towards it has something to do with her disappearance because the car keys are gone. This was the sweet Miss Sweet Potato pageant. Yeah, I, I won in 1996. That's funny because in 2006, Columbus named me Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> There is some, there's also some confusion as to the whereabouts of Tara's dog, Dolly. Now, Dolly was a, from my understanding, like a large German shepherd. This was not a small dog. Uh, not like Frank. Yeah. Uh, some articles say that the dog was found outside in the backyard, and then other articles just say that the dog and cat were found, but no specifics as to where they were found. Yeah, you'd think that maybe the neighbors would report seeing the dog outside for multiple days. I don't know how the poor tears. So from the poor tears house, you can see Tara's home and right. you can see most of her yard because the way that they're situated, you, you should be able to see the front and backyard of her home from some of their windows. Right. But they wouldn't know this because they were out of town. I'm just wondering if there was other neighbors that would have noticed the dog being out for multiple days. Uh, it seems to me that people just lean towards the idea that the dog was outside. If the dog were to be outside, though, that's where I question what's going on with the portiers because they are made aware that Tara has not been heard from on Sunday evening. They would have seen the dog outside. They don't report that to her mother. Hey, we saw the vehicle outside. Right. But they don't state that, hey, we everything must be fine. She's clearly let the dog out. But by this time, by the time she was found on Monday morning, then that dog would have been out all night long, which would have seemed suspicious to me unless that was a regular thing for her. Who knows? I mean, it was a fenced-in area, I'm guessing. Everybody lives different lives. Um, the important thing here, though, Captain, is that would Tara's abductor or would-be abductor put the dog outside to, you know, because German Shepherds are by nature, aggressive dogs, right? This is a dog that probably would have eagerly protected her. Should she have been ab attacked or abducted from inside the home or near the home? Finally, the other strange thing about the crime scene is a business card was found tucked into Tara's front door with the name Heath Dykes on it. Mm. Now, police were quick to state that they did not suspect foul play saying that nothing they had found uh, led them to the conclusion that something had happened to Tara. Her disappearance would continue to be investigated as a missing persons case. Tara's family, however, disagreed with this. Tara's sister, Anita, said Tara would have never gone anywhere without her phone, would never leave her pets alone for a long period of time, presumably over 30 hours or so by the time Joe entered the home, and she would have never just not have shown up to work. It was just totally out of character for her sister. Now, Anita said it looked like someone had attempted to make Tara's bed. Apparently, Tara was quite particular about how she made the bed or how the bed was made, and it was not found in the manner that her sister would have expected to find her bed. And there were clothes on her bedroom floor. Anita right. said that Tara made the... Had she made the bed... She would have never left the clothes on the floor. Now, the clothing that was found on the floor, this is the clothes that Tara was seen wearing on that Saturday evening at the barbecue. Anita also identified a few more missing things. There were earrings Tara was wearing that day, which her friend, Miss Davis, recalled having seen Tara wearing them at the barbecue. These earrings were not found. Uh, also missing were a pair of sweatpants and a T-shirt. These are items that are believed that Tara would usually wear to bed and had slept in. Also, after further searching the house, pieces of a necklace Tara had been wearing on that Saturday were found under the bed. Anita later went on Fox News and the CBS early show to bring attention to her sister's disappearance and ask the public for help. 
All right, so it seems to me that she, Tara, went to this barbecue. She comes home. She possibly lets her dog out, changes her clothes, gets out of the barbecue clothes, the daytime clothes, and she's going to slip into something more comfortable, but maybe she leaves the hoop earrings on because those are not found. At some point, this we, we think that she was possibly wearing the, that necklace this day, and so that somehow came off and it's broken. Yeah, there were pieces of it found underneath her bed. So then we have this alarm clock that is six hours off. So does that tell us something? Is there Was there an attack that happened and then the power went out on the clock and then it was plugged back in? And, and does that give us a time frame of when possibly she was attacked? It should, but uh, there's no report on what time the clock was reading when found. Just that it was six hours different. Yeah, I mean, it could be six hours uh, earlier or after right. you would expect to find it. Tara's sister's theory in the early days was that Tara had got home from the barbecue and she was getting ready for bed and had been interrupted by someone possibly that she knew, perhaps a friend, student, or another teacher had possibly knocked on the door, interrupting her, and then at some course she is abducted during that evening. Well, and investigators are going to look at all possible angles of this, and it seems, you know, one, did somebody, you know, there's no sign of breaking and entering, so so it's like, did somebody do that, or did she leave on her own? Yeah, the possibility of... Could she have just left? And this comes up because in the course of some interviews with people close to Tara, police discovered that Tara was in a fragile emotional state after the breakup of a very long-term relationship with her boyfriend. This is Marcus Harper. Right. Tara had apparently been distraught over aspects of this emotionally charged situation. One day becoming so overcome while driving that she had to pull over and call a friend for help. The next day, she called in sick to work, which was unusual for Tara. We'll discuss the former boyfriend, Marcus Harper, and their relationship in just a bit. But it was so widely believed that Tara was under a lot of stress. I mean, she's working two jobs and studying for a very demanding degree. Right. Her mother was ill. Perhaps the theory went it was all just too much for her and she wanted to escape. Well, on, on top of that, she's a family person and she's a sociable person and she's trying to be a, a pillar of the community. So you're talking about a lot of things that are weighing on her shoulders. Well, Tara's family would call BS on this theory. As we said, Anita pointed out that Tara would never go anywhere without her phone. She would never leave Dolly and Herman to fend for themselves. And it looks like she was just weeks away from completing her studies for another graduate degree which would have meant a bump in salary of up to 10 grand for her. So why would she abandon all of her hard work? And furthermore, her family question, how would she have left in the middle of the night without her car in a town with little to no public transportation? It just, it just didn't make any sense. Police quickly began to re receive tips about the missing persons case, but nothing panned out. Investigators said they weren't ruling out the possibility that Tara had been abducted or or had voluntarily took off with someone she knew. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or GBI, was brought in very early in this case, and within days, a massive search operation was underway. Hundreds of searchers and volunteers conducted daily searches of Osceola and more remote areas of the 358-square-mile Irwin County, looking for signs of terror or clues as to what may have happened. Searchers used horses, ATVs, helicopters, and underwater scanning equipment. A week after the disappearance of Tara, there's going to be a bombshell that drops in the news. The neighbor, Joe Portier, he had found a latex glove in Tara's front yard on the day that he had went over to check on her. Police tried to keep the discovery of this glove a secret, presumably in order to keep some evidence under wraps so they could use the information as they saw fit down the road. Nevertheless, Osceola was a small town and word had got out about the glove. Joe Portier told Nancy Grace that the glove was the type used in a medical setting and not a glove that would be typically used for things like dishwashing or gardening. Right. Reports conflict as to whether the glove was white 
or whether it was blue in color. But of course, either way, the presence of a latex glove at the scene of a possible abduction made Tara's friends and family very concerned. back cheers mates i got a mouthful of chips golden crisp from maslin ohio yeah cheers to uh jesse and mary our friends over at golden crisp you know what they say captain the old the old famous saying the best potatoes come from idaho the best potato chips come from ohio well all i know is they're good with beer well back to the search efforts captain Tara Grinstead's family set up a command center in downtown Osceola to help coordinate volunteers and disseminate flyers and posters. Within two weeks, there was a reward for information in the case. This was of $30,000. One thing that was not addressed at all was whether police used scent dogs to try to track Tara's scent to determine whether she had left the house. What we do know is is that search and rescue dogs were brought in about a week after Tara disappeared and searched areas near her home, this including ponds and wooded areas. Presumably nothing was found. A woman's t-shirt was found during a search, Mm -hmm. but investigators ruled this out saying it had nothing to do with Tara's disappearance. So two weeks after the last known sighting of Tara, news reports revealed that the police had interviewed scores of people who knew or who were connected to Tara. They were poring over Tara's phone records and checking her home and school computers. And by this point, they had polygraphed at least one person and were following up on undisclosed leads. But police still refused to categorize Tara's disappearance as the result of foul play. Tara's friends and family were beginning to give up hope that she would ever return home safely. Tara's family hired a private detective to look into the case. This investigator believed the car seat being found pushed back was a big red flag, as do I, as do you. Mm -hmm. Fears began to arise that Tara had been the victim of some inexplicable random attack by a stranger and that she was dead. Even so, the Grinstead family persisted and manned the Tara Command Center, pushing the Osceola PD and the GBI for more searches. Mm -hmm. They were also passing out buttons with Tara's picture on them, and they even decorated Tara's house as if she were coming home. They decorated for Halloween, and they put up a happy birthday banner for Tara's 31st birthday, which took place in November of 2005. Yeah, and by December 2005, law enforcement's going to have all their ground searches. They're going to declare those done. Yeah, and this would still have no signs of Tara. A press conference was held around that same time revealing that the reward money in Tara's case had jumped up to $200,000. A large portion of this amount of money was donated anonymously. Then in January of 2006, with Tara having been missing for three months, her family helped organize a large-scale search conducted by Texas EquiSearch and 150 volunteers. The focus of the ground search in Irwin and surrounding counties was the hundreds of wells sprinkled throughout the marshy countryside. Searchers also used boats to access shallow swamps. As Tara's colleague and friend Wendy McFarland put it, quote, on one hand, you pray to God to find her. On the other hand, you pray to God, you don't find her. Yeah. In February of 2006, the Osceola police told the Atlantic Journal-Constitution, quote, It does seem to be kind of an overwhelming and baffling case. We've had missing persons before, but usually those turn up in a few days, usually juveniles who come back to their homes. Nevertheless, the GBI claimed that the Grinstead case was still a very active investigation with active leads being pursued. Tara's family was increasingly frustrated by the lack of progress in the case. They brought in an investigative psychologist, this is, Dr. Maurice Godwin. With Godwin's help, the family concluded that Tara had been the victim of foul play and was likely dead. The family also became publicly critical of the Irwin County Sheriff's Department and its handling of the investigation. So now, Captain, we see 
the family begin to take matters into their own hands and at one point even attempting to conduct a search on private property. Well, okay. So I agree why they'd be frustrated. But as far as law enforcement goes, this is a frustrating case because if somebody is responsible for her going missing, if this is foul play, let's look at a couple things. One, she's a teacher. Now, the graduating class, is it's a small town. It's under normally 100, but she taught for some years. So now you have all the students that she's come in contact with, all the people through the beauty pageants that she's come in contact with. She's in night classes, so all the people that she's taken night classes with. This is somebody that is um, heavily involved in her um, in, in her local community, and there's going to be a lot of people that you have to question. So as much as it's frustrating for the family, I can see where it's frustrating for law enforcement as well. This is my, my head kind of goes back to the Barry Sherman and Honey Sherman case that we recently covered. And I'm going to kind of just echo something today that I said when we covered that case. I don't, I've never understood why a police officer or a detective or a police chief will come out so early on when they have no clue what happened right. and go, well, we don't see any signs of foul play. We're going to investigate this as a missing persons case. Why even bother to say that? You're just you're you're throwing yourself to the fire there. Well, I, I think it's ignorance as far as an investigative uh, tactic. I mean, you have to basically have no blinders, right? You have to be open to any possibility. And I think when somebody comes out and makes statements like that, I question their ability to investigate any crime because you can't come up with a theory and then try to make that theory stick. You need to be letting the evidence you know, it's almost like a funnel. Let the evidence lead you down the path to the truth. I think what happens is when they when the cameras turn on and they have to stand in front of people and give some kind of explanation as to what's going on or the direction of the investigation, mm -hmm. I think they get nervous. And I think that maybe they say things that had they taken some time to think it through, they would have said something differently. And I think it's maybe a portion of, of the investigation part, but more so the the public appeal or, or appealing to the public, I should say what, what I'm getting at is just with the, just like with the Sherman case, mm -hmm. here's the thing. You and I both know that so many cases get solved because of, of a confession. If somebody out there is feeling super guilty or if they're super scared that law enforcement are on to them or somebody knows what they did, they may come forward to try to save their own butt. Well, more likely if they feel there's some heat on them. Yes. Right. And if I'm at the crime scene and I'm the chief, the chief of police and I'm going, we don't see any foul play and yeah. I'm watching that on TV. I'm going, shit, they don't, they don't have anything on me. They don't even know that a crime's been committed. Right. Just keep my mouth shut. So Stay again, cool. again, I would have the same statement for every situation. When approached by the media, I would say, look, we have a lot of evidence to sort through. Mm -hmm. We will let the investigation and the leads take us where it may. We have a lot of eyewitnesses. We have witnesses to statements to go through mm -hmm. and we are going to work this case morning, noon and night until it's solved. And I just leave it at that. We're not stating that any foul play happened. We're not stating that any foul play did not happen. Yeah. But I'd also throw in there as well. We're getting closer to knowing the truth and just saying that that's not a wrong statement. Even if you're in the dark about whatever's happening. Yeah, the more the more work you're going to do, the closer you're going to get to the truth is. And I think by making those statements, like you said, you give yourself a chance of somebody coming forward and and, and confessing to this. Yeah, if I'm if I'm watching the news and I hear the sheriff's department or the police chief state to the news, we have a lot of evidence to go through, mm -hmm. a lot of witnesses to talk to. I'm sitting at home going, shit, what did I leave at the crime scene? Who saw me? Somebody must have saw me. And then you start getting scared and then you do things that don't make sense. If you don't decide to come forward and confess, maybe those around you are going, wait a second, this guy's not acting right. He could have been involved and point the police in his direction. Now, I do understand the Grinstead family's frustration here because, you know, while they're not investigators, I, I, I get where they're coming from. They're, they are going to the sheriff's department. And they're saying, Look, the things that we saw at her home just don't add up to us. Right. We're telling you it doesn't make sense to us that she just walked away. And now months into this, that's that's going to back up their gut feeling. 
Well, no, and it's also a small town, so what rumors are they hearing uh, from people in the community? Well, we know this, that Tara's sister Anita told the media that the sheriff's office had failed to convey important leads to the GBI, and this she was citing two witness reports of a black pickup truck, likely a Chevy, Mm. parked outside of Tara's home around 5 a.m. on Sunday morning, October 23rd. So she is last seen late Saturday night. And then there's a possible black pickup seen at her home very early Sunday morning. Actually, this takes place under the cover of darkness. Mm -hmm. We won't start to see the rise of of the sun there till just after 6 a.m. on this date. So roughly at 5 a.m., this is under the cover of night. Now, another witness came forward, too, stating that they had seen a similar truck, not so much at her home or parked near her home, but in the area. Mm -hmm. around this same time and said that they had had some kind of verbal exchange with a man that was either standing next to the truck or possibly driving the truck. So we have two separate witnesses coming forward regarding this strange black pickup truck, possibly a Chevy. Yeah, but Tara's sister is also going to state in this interview that the family believes that whoever was responsible for taking Tara probably return the following day or at some point to kind of clean up the scene and try to take care of whatever evidence was left. This could be when the latex glove was dropped. So the abductor or abductors return to the home and at some point drops the latex glove. The weird thing here too, is that the glove had not been seen by two people who had, who had stopped by Tara's house right. on that Sunday looking for her, even though later we learn it was found in plain sight. So the glove was found in the front yard near the front stoop, but not until Monday when the police were on the scene. Yeah, but sometimes people just don't pay attention. So, Well, also, I guess, you know, this would lead the family to believe that this meant that the person who took Tara, that they returned, not only did they return, but it was probably, possibly Sunday night Mm -hmm. because people had been there through the course of Sunday and not seen this glove. In May of 2006, the media began to report that investigators had recovered a DNA sample from the Grinstead crime scene. Nearly 150 people connected to Tara had been swabbed in a search for a match to the DNA sample. The GBI refused to confirm the existence of the DNA or address this part of the investigation at all. But by 2008, as the case was in danger of growing cold, They were desperate for a break. GBI Special Agent Gary Rothwell revealed on CBS's 48 Hours that the DNA sample was found on the latex glove. And the sample belonged to a male. And he, I I question my notes here, but I do have in my notes that at some point it's reported that the DNA belonged to an unknown white male. Mm Mm-hmm. But no match to anyone who knew Tara had been made at this point, and the sample received no hits from the Georgia or the national DNA databases. And you're probably thinking that they're testing the ex-boyfriend at this point. I would imagine anyone that's willing to participate Mm -hmm. uh, unless they go and get a court order. After a very intense investigation and a lot of rumors in the community, there's going to become three major suspects through the course of the investigation. Authorities were obviously looking into Tara's personal life for any indication that anyone that she knew or was involved with could be a suspect in this case of her disappearance. Mm -hmm. And there were some suspects and few, here's the thing, few, if any that they looked at had a concrete alibi that covered what the police believed to be the disappearance window and the problem with that is this window is it's large. The 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 time frame here is large. It starts from Saturday night Saturday night after 11 p.m. and it goes through all day Sunday. Right. So there are the lives of several of these men, and they're they're all men that were considered to be the top three suspects, whether it be in the eyes of the public or through investigators. And I say they're all men because there seems to be no indication that at any point investigators ever seriously considered that a woman could have been responsible. This probably from the DNA sample that they were, they found on the glove. 
So the first person of interest that I think we should discuss, Captain, is somebody that I've referenced and that you've mentioned as well, and this is Marcus Harper. Mm -hmm. Marcus Harper was an ex-Ocilla police officer who had been Tara's boyfriend for um, about five to six years. There's some kind of conflicting reports on how long or how strong, let's say, the relationship was for over the course of that time frame. But Marcus and Tara were, by some accounts, inseparable. Uh, they were a typical small town love story. And I guess Tara assumed that one day they might get married, according to her friends anyway. Some people have stated that Marcus had a key to her home. Mm -hmm. But after... So, okay, so the two of them, from what I can gather, is this. Their, their relationship is a strange one from somebody looking this f from the outside in this far away, right? And somebody who's had some strange relationships, yeah. From what is reported is that the two of them, Marcus and Tara, they were very much in love. But after 9-11, Marcus joined the mil military and served in Afghanistan and Iraq in the Rangers. After his tour, Marcus became an independent contractor in Iraq. Because of this job, Marcus didn't spend much time in Osceola, obviously. Now, Tara was not happy about Marcus's decision to continue in the independent contractor role. No, and this she guy's making a lot of money, though. She became increasingly aware that Marcus was not interested in marriage. So the two began to bicker and to disagree, although friends said that things never got violent at any point. Mm -hmm. Now, Connie Grinstead, this is Tara's stepmother, who was very close with her, said that the relationship was stormy for the final two years of the relationship and that they both at times dated other people, but they would always come back to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they broke up in October of 2004, this according to Marcus, but they continued to see each other. And in a brief uh, reconciliation, the two vacationed together in Florida. So a few months before Tara went missing in 2005, uh, their relationship continued to be volatile. Finally, Tara sent Marcus a letter when he was stationed abroad, essentially breaking things off. But then she appears to have changed her mind and wanted to rekindle their relationship. Mm. Marcus, however, said that they would remain broken up. Tara did not accept this. And by all accounts, she was devastated by Marcus's decision. So it seems like one thinks they're on a break and the other doesn't think they're on a break. Somebody might consider there to be a break. The other one's not on the same page. And then you can flip it and reverse it almost that the, the other one seems to think they're on a break and the right. other does not seem to agree. I guess she and Marcus continue to go back and forth about the state of things of their actual relationship. And at some point, Tara even emailed Marcus's mother with some strange comments about something possibly happening to her or to him because of the breakup. Let me just put this out there. If you're in a relationship, adult, adult relationship, once you start reaching out to friends and family members, uh, it's probably, it's probably past, uh, past the state of no return. Yeah. Uh, I think in, de in Tara's defense, it sounds like she might've been close with Marcus's mother. Mm -hmm. Um, and that they had known each other for years, uh, possibly five or six years at this point. And I, from what I can gather, I know I'm just saying that the chances of you talking to a guy's mother and then getting things turned back around because of that are probably slim to none. Oh, no, I 100% agree. I think she was trying to confirm that Marcus had received her communications okay, because right. he was not he was not replying to her. Mm -hmm. He was not saying anything back to her. People think this is a big red flag because he actually returns to town without any communication to her. And I kind of wonder if it's one of those situations where they, they talked multiple times after she you know, at some point broke it off while he's over there. And then there, maybe there was a conversation where he's like, look, this is just not going to work out. I'd like to remain friends. And then she's contacting him again going, Hey, no, I really want this to work out. And he's like, Hey, it's not going to work out. I just want to remain friends. And then when he went back to town, he just thought, you know what, what's the point of contacting her? I mean, you wouldn't necessarily just contact your ex just because you got back because 
as technically that's your ex. Right. Now I actually though I I'm I'm going to go the different direction with it. That's fine. I actually think it was weird that he didn't contact her. Why? And because there's like 3000 people live in this town. Mm-hmm. You're going to bump into the other person maybe even relatively quick upon your return. Mhm. You obviously cared for this person for years. In my opinion, I would at least say, hey, look, I'm going to be back in town. I wanted to let you know. I don't really want to see you, but I wanted to let you know in advance because I don't I don't want things to be weird. Right. So because in, in, am I wrong here, though? Because things do get weird because he's back in town and she's unaware of his return. No, I just think it's a difference of opinion. I mean, I. I I just don't find it that strange. I mean, if you guys broke up, then what's the point of contacting your ex when you when you return? At some point, Tara found out that he had, in fact, returned, and he was dating someone. And according to Connie Grinstead, Marcus had told Tara that they were over for good. And remember, this is what we talked about before. This is when the situation happens that Tara is so emotionally distraught about the end of their relationship that she had to pull her car over when she was driving. She called a friend to come pick her up, Mm -hmm. and eventually she called in sick to work the next day. She also left work early at some point over the course of that week, and her sister Anita, who spoke uh, with her daily and knew all about this situation with Marcus, said on CBS's early show that Marcus and Tara had a huge public fight the week before Tara disappeared. And this was about the relationship being over and about Marcus uh, apparently seeing someone at that time. There are also some reports that one of the phone calls that Tara received during the course of the barbecue, the night that she had disappeared at, at uh, Dr. Davis's house, Mm -hmm. uh, this would be around 10 30 PM was from a friend of hers who was at a local bar who had saw Marcus there and was just calling to let Tara know. Why do people do that? Hey, I'm out having a couple drinks and I saw your ex with uh, his new girlfriend and then called the person. That's a, that's a uppity loser. It's just my weird. Opinion, in my opinion. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's like, throwing fuel on the fire of her, her sadness, you know? Well, it's stirring the pot for both Marcus and Tara. It's somebody that's sitting at a bar and, and keep in mind, we're going off of just this very simple statement of I'm sitting at a bar. I see your ex-boyfriend here. I'm going to call you just so you know that he's here. Right. There could be a lot more involved in this situation, but in my opinion, it's just somebody stirring the pot, throwing themselves into a situation that, at least one of the two that were in the relationship didn't want to be in a situation where they had to have communication with one another. Right. So to jump in there seems to be ill-advised at best. So this Marcus guy, he doesn't have an alibi or a solid alibi for the night that Tara went missing. Well, that's, that's actually not the case. Apparently he has an alibi for that night. Marcus told police, and this was backed up by witnesses that he was with his stepsister and her boyfriend and some other friends at a local tavern in Fitzgerald, which is 10 miles away on the night of September, October 22nd. A friend's band was playing there that night. Now, we know this is very likely because one of Tara's friends saw him and then called her and told her, right? Right. So sometime after 1 a.m., he leaves this bar and he went to the Osceola Police Department to find his buddy Shane Fletcher, who was a active Osceola police officer. The police dispatcher notified Fletcher that Marcus was there and was looking for him. This was around 1.49 a.m. They met up and Marcus worked Fletcher's beat with him. During this time, they were seen by and spoke to several other people. Police records of the calls that came in that evening show that Fletcher and Marcus were responding to calls together, including a last call. The last call of that evening was at a 24 hour gas station, which concluded around 428 AM. Apparently this, I found this to be strange. Apparently in Osceola, uh, this is a small enough town that ex cops can go to a bar and then follow it up with hanging out with a, you know, with an active police officer. And there's some reports that state that it almost gives the impression that Marcus was behaving as an active 
officer that night. Right. So after this ride along, Marcus says that he then went home and he, it's time to go to bed. You know, it's, it's almost five in the morning. So while he can't account for his time after 5 a.m. on October 23rd, investigators have, they had no evidence that he was any way involved in what happened to Tara. They spoke with nine different witnesses. This included police officers, the dispatcher, and civilians who all backed up Marcus's story. So his alibi up until 5 a.m. is airtight. Now, his family, this being his mother and father, told investigators that he was with them on Sunday, and according to his lawyer, Marcus accounted to GBI for every minute of his time during the time from when Tara was last seen until she was reported missing on Monday morning. Despite the alibi, though, Captain, Marcus was the leading suspect in the eyes of the public. In their eyes, Marcus could have conspired with his police officer buddies to cover up the murder of Tara. Right, and that would make sense why we found the glove. Well, further, he was trained in stealth tactics as a member of the Special Forces. So one could assume he could likely kill someone and possibly dispose of them, maybe even permanently. Mm. Rumors flew that Marcus had been jealous of Tara dating other men and so that he had killed her. Now, on the advice of his attorney, Marcus appeared on TV as the subject of interviews. This was to clear up rumors and innuendo being leveled at him on social media and as the investigation dragged on. Mm -hmm. He was filmed in profile so as not to compromise his security in Iraq. Uh, In one interview, Marcus said that he and Tara never had the huge argument that Tara's sister Anita had referred to, this being about another woman that Marcus was dating. He said that the last time that he had seen Tara was about 9 a.m. on October 14th, so more than a week before she disappeared. This was when Tara had turned up at his house. Marcus said that Tara had threatened to commit suicide, though he added that she had returned later that same day, and they seemed to work things out. She asked him for a hug, and they both parted and went their separate ways with the understanding that that would be the last time that they hung out together. Right. Now, according to a report that w- that I found in Crime Library, Tara's friends and family dispute Marcus's allegations that Tara was suicidal. They say that after Tara left Marcus's on the 14th, she then went to a tanning salon and then hung out with relatives. And they state that that behavior was hardly, in their opinion, that of a suicidal depressive person. Well, I mean, his claims early on uh, were, I mean, they were pretty, uh, pretty harsh. I mean, he was basically saying she pulled a gone girl. You know that she, you know that he did not believe that she was dead, and they would have to actually, you know, show him a body to, to prove that she was actually murdered. Well, and by all accounts, too, Marcus was helpful and cooperative with the investigation, even giving police a DNA sample, and it was determined he was not a match to the sample that they found on the latex glove. And he says he spoke to GBI four or five times. And he even let them search his truck using luminal. Now, Marcus not being named a suspect by authorities did not deter Tara's family from being convinced that he was somehow involved in her disappearance or murder. Right. According to Marcus, Anita outright accused him of harming Tara. The search that the Grinstead family members attempted of the private property, this is what we discussed earlier, was in fact on Marcus's property. This was in March of 2006. Terrace family brought cadaver dogs and volunteers to search the 100 acre area of land surrounding Marcus's home, which had not been searched by the sheriff's department. They did not have permission to be there. However, a neighbor of Marcus's had given searchers some permission to access his property, which butts right up to Marcus's. But apparently the, the Irwin County Sheriff showed up. And they were threatening to arrest the searchers. This was in order to keep them off of Marcus's private property. Marcus did, however, agree to a subsequent search of his property, but he wanted this to be conducted by actual law enforcement. 
This did take place. He later declined to press any charges against the people that were trespassing onto his land. Now, this is a very tough situation to be in because you have a relationship that didn't work out now. Who knows why, right? But you did care about this person at some point. So even if they're acting a little distraught or you're not in favor of how they're acting towards you, you still have feelings towards them and they go missing. But now it gets a little weird because everybody's pointing the finger at you. It seems like time and time again, he's at least being cooperative. Mm-hmm. So it's it's strange to me how long he was the number one suspect and it seemed like in the public's uh, opinion. Well, I, it seems to me like he was always the number one suspect in the yeah. public's opinion. I question how long he was a suspect in the police's opinion. Right, and, right. and because what I mean by that is his actions, I actually could not see him a way to be more cooperative. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can understand not have wanting a random group of people showing up, searching your property. Mm-hmm. What if somebody were to plant something? You don't know who these people, you don't trust them. Right. And him being former police, I can understand that. He, well, he trusted the police and right. he trusted the system, you know, and what say, he's going to do is say, look, I don't know who you people are, so you can't search my property. However, in, in the, in the course of being fully transparent toward the investigation of this missing woman, I will allow law enforcement to search my property. The only thing that I, there was one thing that I found weird here. Well, I, I should be I should be fair to Marcus because this is this is the shoe on the other foot kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. So he did agree to take a polygraph test, but this was not administered by uh, local law enforcement. This was he had through his attorney hired his own person to administer the test, mm-hmm. and that was the test that was submitted to law enforcement. I, that seems a little strange, but saying that. If I were, if I were under the microscope, I wouldn't even agree to, even if I were, somebody asked me this a month ago, um, what, what if you were 100% innocent and you were being looked at in a murder investigation? I said, well, first thing first, I would get a lawyer. And second thing, I would not take a polygraph test. And they said, well, why not? I said, because you have nothing to gain by taking the polygraph test. If you're completely innocent, you have nothing to gain from taking the polygraph test. Yeah, but some sometimes lawyers will have their clients do it just just so the lawyer gets a read on the client. Yeah, and gets to charge the client a little extra yeah, yeah. case, shola. Uh, one final element that contributed to the public speculation about Marcus and gave rise to even more conspiracy theories. This would have been about two weeks after Tara's disappearance. There was some kind of strange big fire that took place on a nearby property. This is on Snapdragon Road. The fire destroyed a home and an SUV. The house, for whatever reason, was supposedly being caretaken by Marcus's buddy. This is Michael Langford, Mm -hmm. uh, who was an active Osceola police officer. Police took cadaver dogs through the burned out scene. I have police listed in here, and I, I, I question if this was police or if it was an outside source. But at some point... Search dogs or cadaver dogs did go to the scene of this fire. Mm -hmm. Um, They stated that nothing was found in relation to Tara. There are reports out there that one of these dogs hit on something. Um, Apparently, that was most likely a septic line or some sewage. Um, Needless to say, this connection between Marcus and this suspicious fire right after Tara went missing did not improve the The court of public opinion, right? Right, right. And then let's go on to suspect number two, shall we? This is a man named Anthony Vickers. Who is Anthony Vickers? He was a 20-year-old at the time of Tara's disappearance, 20-year-old former student of Tara's, who by all accounts had some kind of... there. All right, I, I say all accounts, but this is a strange thing. Because there are some small reports out there that state he was obsessed with her. There are other reports out there in Anthony Vickers' own words that they were having an actual relationship at the time of her disappearance or shortly before. An intimate relationship. Yeah. Right. So, And there is uh, actual accounts of them hanging out. So it's weird because you get kind of two sides of the story. But in the middle, you do have this 
scenario where she is hanging out with one of her former students. Yes. Well, and then you also have this strange thing with Anthony Vickers that took place in March of 2005 when Anthony was arrested for showing up at Tara's home. And apparently he's banging on the door demanding to speak with her. She's inside the home Mm -hmm. at the time, but refusing to answer the door. Inside the home with Tara was a male visitor. And I guess she finally opened the door. Right. And at that time, Anthony Vickers tried to forcibly enter the home. Let me in, like fear. And at one point, he grabs her arm. The male visitor at Tara's house was Heath Dykes, who is a Perry County detective. Mm. Osilla PD was called, and Anthony cursed out the arresting officers. Tara pressed charges against Anthony. He was charged with uh, disorderly conduct. And later, the charges were dropped. Now, and, that's not the story he tells people. The story he tells people is that he was over there hanging out. They got in an argument. One of the neighbors calls because they hear hears them arguing. Mm-hmm. The cops show up, and then he continues, you know, because he's angry, continues to argue with the police officers, and then they have to arrest him. I don't know. I must have missed the part where he said that they were hanging out. But what what I recall him stating to kind of clarify the situation is that he lived relatively close to, okay. So the, the police department, Osceola police department is relatively close to Tara Grinstead's home that she's right. renting. And that at some course, the neighbor, like you said, the neighbors called the police. So he would be unaware that the police were on their way. Right. But whatever happened while he was there, according to Anthony Vickers, it was kind of over and done with in his mind. He felt like he had said what he wanted to say, whether regardless of how loudly he said it, that he was, he was preparing to leave her home, that he was it was not going to escalate further, that he was going to leave her home. And before, as he was walking to his vehicle, the police showed up because they were so close. Right. Had they, had she not lived in that close proximity to the police department he would have been well on his way and these charges would have never been brought in the first place. This is relatively close in time from when she went missing, right? No, this was in March of 2005. So, I mean, it's the same year. It's yeah, seven, like six seven months, months before. Yeah. Authorities did interview Anthony very quickly after Tara's disappearance. Anthony also agreed to take a polygraph and the Vickers family property was searched Anthony maintained that he and Tara had some type of long-term romantic relationship. Those are his words that they were keeping under wraps because it would damage Tara's career and reputation to be involved with a young ex student. Keep in mind at this time, he would have been one of her students just years before. Right now, none of Tara's friends or family support this thought that the two were involved together. And another wrinkle in this whole case Mm -hmm. is that regarding that incident of Anthony Vickers being arrested, one of the Osceola PD officers responding to that situation at Tara's home was none other than Sean Fletcher. Remember, we said that this Sean Fletcher was Marcus Harper's cop buddy. Right. They hung out the night that that she disappeared. And Tara later filed an official complaint against Fletcher because he violated his duty to protect her privacy regarding information that he learned during the course of performing his duties as an officer. So, so he told his friend about this uh, student. Yes. Well, yeah, he tells Marcus at a later time that, Hey, we showed up to your ex's house one night and, and there were two people over there. Heath Dykes was there mm. and two men yeah. and Anthony Vickers was outside. And the result was we arrested Anthony Vickers. I guess now would be the appropriate time to talk about Heath Dykes. And he's probably the most uh, interesting suspect, I think. Yeah. Captain Heath Dykes. He was a married Perry, Georgia police officer who had dated Tara Grinstead when they were attending Hawkinsville high school together. So a former relationship with this person. He was also close with Tara's family. Now, it was Heath who was at Tara's home when Anthony Vickers was arrested for that disorderly conduct. We know that. 
In the course of, of their investigation, police heard from Tara's neighbors that Heath was a regular visitor to Tara's home, even though he had lived over an hour away. Some say uh, that Heath would deliberately park. He would deliberately not park his vehicle in Tara's driveway as though trying to avoid people noticing that he was there. Right. Uh, when Tara's mother could not reach her on that Sunday in October, 2005, she did call Heath Dykes and asked him to check on Tara. Heath left Tara many voicemails that day and called her cell phone close to like 30 times over the course of the day. Eventually not hearing from Tara, he drives out to Osceola. He knocks on her door I don't know how long he's there for. And we now know, obviously Tara didn't never answer the door. Uh, perhaps he, presumably he saw her car there and he decided that she was probably not interested in any visitors or she was not home and didn't want to take his phone calls. So he then tucks his business card into her front door and he leaves. And I'm kind of unclear about this. Maybe you can clear this up. Are they romantic at this time? I, I don't think anybody has a clear picture of what their involvement was together. Okay. What is weird is that he would be responding to her mother, not knowing where she is. And we do know that at least on one occasion, regardless of what the neighbors say, whether he parked in her driveway or would park down the street and walk over, regardless of what they say, we know from Osceola police department, reports of the Anthony Vicker situation that at least on one occasion he was at her home right for an unknown reason it seems but they could just be friends I mean they could just well by all accounts by his account and by um, Tara's family's account he's described as a friend of the family okay so um, like you said it, he could be he could just be friends with her but of course you know regardless the public, has a field day with the gossip surrounding Heath Dykes. Right now he's alibi for that Saturday night when she was last seen, he was with his wife uh, who said that he was at home with her all night long, but he was also one of the people who had stopped by Tara's on Sunday. And yet, you know, we don't know what time or when or why that latex glove was dropped at the scene. Yeah. But if it were to be there when he arrives to check up on her, well, he doesn't see this glove that's in plain sight. See, I always wondered that sometimes these law enforcement officers will carry latex gloves in their back pocket. And I always wondered if he, you know, reached out because he left his business card. You know, did he le did he reach into his wallet and accidentally pull out this glove? Mm hmm. Um. So I thought long and hard about this uh, Heath Dykes character and what his, could his involvement have been? So my first thought is this, if he, look, he's, he's not just a police officer. He's, he's listed as a captain and a detective. So he has some very good inside knowledge of the way that these things work and the way to conduct yourself during the course of an investigation, especially if you're being looked at. And what I mean by this is I think if he had been considered a strong suspect and if he was getting a lot of heat for this, I would have suspected that he would lawyer up very quickly and that he would probably submit DNA and right. that they could clear him very quickly in this. I did ask a um, detective. He's not active in the sense that he's out in any crime scenes actively to this day, but he would have been 10 years or so ago. And that's roughly about the time, you know, that's when she disappeared. Right. And I asked him, I said, look, um, I would imagine, you know, duh, they have your meaning law enforcement. They have your fingerprints on file and they have, they have people's fingerprints on file for any number of reasons. But if you're in right. law enforcement, they have your fingerprints on file. There is some thought that there was a fingerprint found at the scene didn't report on it because it seems to be it seems to be sketchy if that is in fact true right but but we also have eyewitness accounts of him being at the house before then so does a does a fingerprint mean that this guy is guilty right know? so there that leads you to want to know the situation with dna 
Mm-hmm. And that's why I say if he were innocent, he would get a lawyer. Well, even if he's guilty, he'd get a lawyer. But if he right. were innocent, he would submit his DNA very quickly and they could clear him and say that glove at least didn't belong to Heath Dykes. If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. So I asked this officer, I said, you know, 10 years ago or even today, do you think that they would have crime scene technicians, detectives, police officers, if they would have those person's DNA on file? And he said he didn't think that they would. And he knew that 10 years ago they did not. Well, this is also a very small community as well. Well, and he brought up, he brought up something that, that we should point out is that it would be expensive to have everyone's DNA on file, first of all. Right. And second of all, I said, well, I said, how do I know that? Because I told him, I said, here's my concern with this latex glove. I'm putting a whole lot of weight and a lot of people, other people are putting a whole lot of weight into the evidentiary value of this latex glove where it could just be have left. It was found outside. Right. If it had it been found inside, inside, I would put more weight to it. But outside, you wonder, is this just something that happens to be there and it's screwing up the whole investigation? Right, because people could be checking the DNA against that glove and it, it doesn't match. And they go, okay, well, you're cleared. And this glove could have just came from a neighbor's house or this glove could have came from who knows where. Well, and what I was doing when I was talking with this person was I said, you know, I don't give him the name of the victim or the name of the case that way he doesn't he's not answering my questions with any preconceived thoughts or notions of his own Mm -hmm. and so i just said look what's the chances of a detective or a crime scene technician dropping a glove at the scene he said first off it, it would be in his career and in his understanding and his his experience that never happens Right. That never happens. And I said, well, I said, how do we make certain that it didn't belong to any of those people that showed up on Monday? And that's why nobody saw it until that Monday, that nobody saw it on Sunday. Right. And he said, well, the first way that they would do it was that they would typically wear latex gloves that aren't, you know, you don't just go to Home Depot and buy the brand that the law enforcement's using. He said the fastest and the cheapest way to clear it from being anybody involved in law enforcement would be to check the brand and the make of mm-hmm. the latex glove. And he said they had never he had never worked a scene where they were using a glove that was common to anything else in the scene. So I found that to be interesting. Now, what he did bring up immediately after after that thought had passed, he said who would leave the glove there would be medical technicians. Mm-hmm. You know, people showing up in an ambulance, EMTs, he said they constantly leave things at crime scenes. <laughs> That's right. He's yeah, that. but th- they have a right, different, right. Con- different concern. Mm-hmm. They're there to save someone's life while police are there to pres- preserve the scene. Right. But it's not out of the realm of possibilities that it could happen. You know, somebody dropped a glove and felt stupid about it and just never brought it to anybody's attention. But you think if they're checking DNA off that glove, somebody would say, Hey, by the way, that's my glove. I dropped that. Yeah. Yeah. If they're going to the point of eliminating suspects using the DNA found on that glove. Now the interesting thing, we don't know that for sure. The interesting thing though here, captain is that with his comment about EMTs constantly leaving things at the scene, we know that that couldn't be the case here because the ambulance was never called. Right. It never, there was no need for EMTs to arrive on the scene. So that didn't happen then. But what I find curious here about the glove and about Heath Dykes' business card, two things. Mm -hmm. One, how does a detective show up to that scene and not notice a latex glove in plain sight? That seems very strange to me. that, That is what they are exactly trained for to detect and deduce things that the average man or woman would not at any given scene. And he's not just showing up to a friend's house. He's showing up to a friend's house where he's been called. He's been alerted by her relative stating, I'm concerned. I've not heard from Tara. Right. But that glove could have been somewhere outside where he couldn't see it. And then moved by, you know, the, the weather a dog could have been moved at some point where it's in plain sight. So people go, Oh man, how can you not see this glove? Well, it's like, well, it might've moved 
you know, doesn't mean that the perpetrator came back in between that time or anything. Uh, it, the glove itself could have just moved. Mm-hmm. I also wonder about the, his business card being found in the door. And I state that because we, by the accounts that I stated on our show, the door or at least a door to the home was open prior to police arriving on the scene. All right. So what you're saying is that at some point he comes by to check on her. She doesn't answer the door. He takes his card and he puts it in the door. Yeah. Then at some point that door is open, but when they come to investigate, his card is still in that door. Well, yeah. so I'm kind of going down two roads with this. One being what you just mentioned. The the door was open prior to police arriving, and then they're saying, we found this card stuck in the door. Mm -hmm. Where if the door was open, it would not, presumably would not have still remained stuck in the door. Unless they're talking about like a screen door, and then so the screen door was open, but his door, his card was stuck in the house door. I'm not really for sure. No, what I mean is that the home was entered, Right. Like, right. so somebody entered the home. So regardless if there's one door there or two at that particular entrance exit to the home, both would have had to been opened to enter the home. So somebody entered and then, then possibly put the card back. What I'm, what I'm getting at though, is I, I'm, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying that there's, there's cause to believe that potentially a different door was accessed by mm-hmm. by the neighbor who entered the home before police arrived on the scene. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh I've I've had a I've lived in a residence before where the front door and the back door had different keys to them. Right. And right. maybe he only had a key to the back door because he was a neighbor or to a side door or whatever. But but the other thing I'm getting at is we have the detective who does not see the glove if it is in fact in the yard at the time that he was present at the house when checking on Tara. We also have a na- a man by the name of Jared Luke. This was a colleague of Tara who had dropped by the house sometime on that Sunday. He was there to retrieve a forgotten water bowl. I guess at some point she had watched or, or pet sitted for him. Right. And so he drops by to retrieve this water bowl that was forgotten. He doesn't see the glove there either. But here's what, here's what I wonder. So because is there there's two doors, right? Let's just, just we're assuming there's two doors. Two doors where? In her house to get in and out of her house. Okay. But the neighbor is friends with her. The the guy retrieving the bowl is friends with her. The cop is friends with her. Mm-hmm. Some people's houses, like, you know, I'd visit your house, your old house a bunch, and I'd probably use your back door the majority of the time. Right. So if I, if somebody said, hey, Nick went missing, can you go check on him? I'd say no. Uh, no, but then I'd go over and check on him, and then I'd probably knock on your back door. Right. So I just wonder if, depending on, which door these people checked or didn't check or knock on. Is that one of the reasons why they didn't see the glove? No. And I get what you're saying, but the, uh, the route that I'm going down with this is that a lot of people are saying, Hey, look, the glove ended up there after these two people went to the house. That that's what a lot of people would suggest that the evidence right, right, right. would show that because the detective didn't see the glove. And because this guy that she worked with or, or colleague of hers, didn't see the glove that, that that somebody came. The thought is that whoever took her came back sometime that Sunday night, cleaned up the scene. And in the course of that action, dropped the glove upon leaving the area. Right. What I'm, what I'm getting at is if you want to argue that it's likely that that's when the person cleaned the scene, my argument would be, okay, if, if that's your one bit of evidence that the scene was cleaned after those two events took place of the people dropping by the home, my other argument would be, well, if the person came to clean the scene after those two people had been there, the card, the detective's card was still stuck in the door. If that person accessed the house through that particular door, the, the card likely would not have been stuck in the door. Right. What I'm getting at is... I believe they cancel each other out. And I think that it's, 
I don't think that the glove not being seen by either of those two people points me to believe that the person returned on Sunday night. I do think that there are certainly some things that show that somebody cleaned up the scene, that they manipulated the crime scene. I personally just think that it happened sometime much earlier than that. Right. And I think that the things that were most manipulated in this situation are things with inside of the home that would not have been seen by either the detective or the colleague returning to collect the water bowl. Maybe some things with the car, but I think those are debatable. And I think you and I agree on those being debatable, the seat and the clay or the mud on the tires. Right. Correct. Do you, do we have time real quick for there are a couple of other potential persons of interest that I want to make sure that we mention before we get to tomorrow's show. Mm-hmm. So the thought being that there are also some theories. We talk about three guys that knew Tara very well. There were also some theories that Tara could have been killed by someone that she was not dating or was not involved with maybe possibly an obsessed stalker. So I want to make sure that we bring up a situation that took place in 2001. Tara had been a victim of a stalker and she had actually pressed charges against an individual. The stalker was unnamed and also only received probation for their actions. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a little speculating here, captain, but my guess is maybe the reason why this stalker is never named either one of two things took place. Either the stalker just pled guilty to the charges with the agreement that his name would not be publicized. Right. Or two, it, with her being a teacher, it might have been a minor. Yeah. It might have been it's somebody, uh, yeah, a male under the age of 18. And another strange twist in 2010, a former student of Terrace committed suicide and left behind a note listing 12 names who he claimed were involved in killing Tara. The list of names has never been released, but we can assume that law enforcement vetted the names on this list pretty carefully. This, according to Dr. Maurice Godwin, he says that the 12 people on the list all gave DNA samples and were cleared. These are the suspects and these are the theories that people would ponder over and debate for years until recently there's been a break in the case. Until tomorrow, everybody out there, be good, be kind, and don't litter.